pastoral images that Jesus used. Not the pastoral images of a pastor and a preacher, but these farm animals, these images of a sheep and a shepherd. I didn't grow up around many sheep in South Carolina, but my grandfather did have beef cattle, and I can tell you that those are some really dumb animals. <laughs> Every time there would be a small hole in the fence, they would pour out into the street and just stand there waiting for the cars to run over them. <laughs> So all these passages from Jesus talking about how he's the shepherd and we're the sheep, it's something that I've always thought that I'd rather not be, a big, fluffy, dumb animal just waiting for someone to run over me, an animal who needs to be taken care of, who needs to be reminded to eat even. But then when we get to today's passage, suddenly being a sheep doesn't look so bad when we consider the alternative, being a goat. And that means eternal doom. I guess sometimes in life it's all about our perspectives and how we see things. Today's passage that Debbie shared from the Gospel of Matthew was actually the Bible passage that I heard quoted most often in January when I attended the Young Clergy Leadership Forum in Washington, D.C. If you remember, that trip was the impetus for this whole six-week sermon series that I've shared with you. That week that Regis and I spent avoiding the biggest snowstorm on the northeast coast and cuddling up with all kinds of people that we would otherwise never have met. They said some surprising things in D.C., which got under my skin and made me want to share these sermons with you the past six weeks based on our United Methodist Church's social principles. Today I'd like to take a moment to share some of those things that got under my skin. We were invited to Capitol Hill one day to meet U.S. Senate Chaplain Reverend Barry Black. He is a Seventh-day Adventist and a former Navy Admiral who served the Senate for 12 years as chaplain. He was a passionate man from Baltimore, Maryland, who turned from agnostic to faith after hearing Dr. Martin Luther King speak in Huntsville, Alabama in the early 1960s. Reverend Black leads a weekly prayer breakfast on the Hill, which 30 senators attend, and a weekly Bible study, which 10 senators attend. And I don't know about you, but it surprised me to hear that a third of our Senate is in weekly prayer. And I thought, that's exactly where they need to be. Reverend Black said, my life is fueled by continuous interaction with the Holy Spirit. And that transcends his denomination or his theological beliefs or even his politics. And I wonder what our lives would look like if we could say that same thing. Our lives are fueled by continuous interaction with the Holy Spirit. As you picture what that might look like, I'd like to share with you the opening words of this sixth and final section of our social principles on the world community. God's world is one world. The unity now being thrust upon us by technological revolution has far outrun our moral and spiritual capacity to achieve a stable world. I don't know if you sense that. I feel that sometimes, that instability which surrounds us all and which we all have to grapple with. The enforced unity of humanity, increasingly evident on all levels of life, presents the church as well as all people with problems that will not wait for an answer. Injustice, war, exploitation, privilege, population, international ecological crises, proliferation of arsenals of nuclear weapons, development of transnational business organizations that operate beyond the effective control of any governmental structure, and the increase of tyranny in all its forms. This generation must find viable answers to these and related questions if humanity is to continue on this earth. We commit ourselves as a church to the achievement of a world community that is a fellowship of persons who honestly love one another. We pledge ourselves to seek the meaning of the gospel in all issues that divide people and threaten the growth of world community. As I, I wonder 
Lord as our redness if we are seeking the meaning of the gospel and all the issues that threaten and divide us as a community. As the second anniversary of our September 2013 floods rolls around next week, and we read in the newspapers about the desperation and the lack of hope of some of our neighbors who still see lions as their home and who still wish to come home, I'm reminded of this morning's passage. Who do we give food and drink to? Whom do we clothe? Whom do we offer a room? And who do we visit when they're sick and in prison? Reverend Black encouraged us, all of us young clergy there in Washington this, this January, to leave the world a better place than we found it. And he had three tips. Target people who don't look like you in your ministry. Reach out to those who are strange. Stretch yourself. Learn new things. Set a higher bar. Keep on growing. And finally, focus on serving, not on self. Be a slave to Jesus Christ. To hear a black pastor encourage me to be a slave is just as jarring for me as hearing Jesus' words encouraging me to be a sheep. It's something to wrestle with. It's something that we all struggle with. But the jarring thoughts didn't stop there. The very next day, we were invited back to Capitol Hill for Union Seminary's first ever Congressional Faith Orientation. In that press conference, U.S. Representative from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee, said we should be bold in our faith, conspicuous. We all need to get a call and get out there and get our souls lifted. And Representative from Missouri, Emmanuel Cleaver, agreed. He said Moses led the first AFL-CIO strike, and the wages were still not sufficient. But it was U.S. Rep from North Carolina, David Price, who shocked me when he said, I rarely invoke my seminary background here on the Hill. It's not the strongest qualification. Why is that? Since theology means the study of the face of God, why is the knowledge of God a poor qualification for becoming a lawmaker? Why are our politicians some of whom are ordained ministers or seminary trained, so hesitant to speak about their faith. And then I looked in the mirror, and I looked around at my circle of friends and family, and I had to ask myself that same question. Why do we hesitate so often to speak of our faith in a world that's desperate for a, world, for a word of hope? Perhaps it's the pull of the way of the world versus the way of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it's the difference between sheep and goat, between those who ignore the pain of others and those who choose to see pain and sit with others in pain. Remember, the word compassion is made up of two parts, compassio, with suffering. We can only grow our empathy and our compassion for our neighbors and for the world if we can learn to sit comfortably when things are painful. And God knows we are surrounded by enough pain these days. But my favorite political quote from the week came from U.S. Representative Jim Clyburn from South Carolina. He was raised in the Church of God, and he's now a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Jim's father expected him to be a preacher. And when he told his dad that he was going into politics instead, his father said, I suspect the world would much rather see a sermon than hear one. You know, I suspect Jim's dad was right. And when we consider world peace today, I wonder what kind of sermon the world can see in our actions. I did a lot of creative writing that week because the thoughts and the quotes were whirling around in my head and I couldn't find any peace. And I kept hearing myself ask that one question. If my life were a wordless sermon, what would it preach? What does your life preach? It is a wordless sermon. Every day, every opportunity is an opportunity to share our faith and our beliefs. Are we slaves to Jesus Christ? Are we doing unto others in this world as Jesus did unto those when he walked among us? This section of the principles, in fact, the entire statement of our social creed ends with these words. We affirm our historic concern for the world as our parish and seek for all peoples and persons 
full and equal membership in a truly world community. I wonder what equal membership in a truly world community even looks like. And I can't stop looking at that and thinking about those images this week from the current global refugee crisis. For those of you who haven't heard, there are an estimated 15 million people worldwide currently displaced from their homes, and that is not even counting our own Lions residents still, still reeling from the flood. Due to violence in Syria and across Africa and the Middle East, we are now living through the largest refugee crisis since World War II. According to the head of the UN's refugee agency, currently one in every 122 people globally is either a refugee, internally displaced, or seeking asylum because he says, quote, the world is a mess. You don't have to have a seminary degree or even to be able to read the Bible to look around you and see that he is right. The world is often a mess. And I, I wonder if world peace is actually achievable because it seems like only those beautiful women in beauty pageants are able to talk about it with such grace and poise. How can I stay poised? when I'm staring at an image of a three-year-old Syrian toddler whose body washed up on the shores of Turkey when his family boat capsized on their way to, to Greece. Tears of anger and injustice and suffering rolled down my cheeks as I read about his father who tried to catch his wife and their five-year-old son but was unable. Those three died, along with eight others that same day, but they are not the only victims. Recently, more than 70 refugees and migrants were found dead in the back of a truck in Austria. Hundreds died in transit off the coast of Libya. Nine were killed in the channel as they tried to jump on top of trains headed from France to England. And thousands have been stranded in Budapest at the train stations where all trains were stopped until early this morning. And as those migrants stood on the train tracks, sleeping on the ground, they shouted out, Merkel, help us, calling for Chancellor Angela Merkel from Germany. Germany is supposedly the most welcoming of all the EU nations to these refugees. It's their goal to make it to Germany. And that really shocks me and hurts my heart because some of you know I spent 12 years in Germany. I lived in Munich for eight years, just a few blocks away from the main train station where these thousands of people are arriving. Germany expects 800,000 refugees to enter the Munich train station this year. And when I lived there, I went to visits with African asylum seekers. I went to the government agencies and asked for their asylum, filled out papers after papers after papers, <coughs> and was often treated without dignity or respect just because the people had black skin that I was with. And when I showed up and spoke German and had white skin, they were treated like human beings. And this is the best that we can do. This is the best that Europe has to offer. And I've been in mourning all this week as I think about it. If you read our midweek message newsletter this week, you've seen a picture of a German soldier smiling at a Syrian child. In my former hometown in Munich, they turned elementary schools into evacuation shelters, much like we did here in this town the first three days after our flood, so that people would not have to sleep on the ground. These refugees are carrying only a backpack, sometimes only a few plastic bags with all of their possessions, and they're risking their lives for any chance at peace. One Syrian former government official said, that he was in the military and led a strike against his own people, and he couldn't do it anymore, so he left. And now he can't return to Syria, he'll be executed. But he can't go anywhere else because his papers are invalid. And he told the media, it doesn't matter if I die trying to cross the ocean. I'm dead already. These images are too close to home. Because a woman reminded me this week as I was trying to get perspective that here in Lyons, we also have refugees. 
And I don't mean just the people who lost their homes. I mean many of us come from other places and came seeking something new or leaving something behind that we needed to get rid of. Maybe we're not political asylum seekers, but many people feel like they can never go back home and they're looking to create a home in this new place. And so I wonder what can we do to make world peace? Because writing social creeds and preaching about these important topics only goes so far and I wonder how can we be with people in their suffering? How can we respond to pain? How can we ever create peace? United Methodist founder John Wesley once wrote, in the full extent of the word, a peacemaker is one that being filled with the love of God and of all mankind cannot confine the expression of it to his own family or friends or acquaintance or party, but in some way or other manifest his love to neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. Wesley echoes the sentiments of Jesus Christ, the sentiments of Reverend Barry Black, and of our own social principles. Until we become one world community, we will be like those dumb goats, only caring for those that are like us and ignoring the needs of others. There was one more thing that I learned in Washington, D.C., and it was a word from Reverend Lloyd Nyarota from Zimbabwe. If any of you speak this native language, please forgive my probably mispronunciation of this word, but it sounded like chabatsa. I invite you to say it after me, chabatsa. It means, come work alongside me, <coughs> or I will come and work alongside you. There are no simple ways to attain world peace, despite what those beautiful beauty pageant contestants may say. But we can begin by working alongside those who are fighting injustice, creating a more just and equal world, and praying for those in power. We can encourage our political leaders to join a prayer breakfast or a Bible study. We can join one ourselves. We can educate ourselves and our children and our grandchildren about Christ's wishes for world peace and neighborly love. We can read a book about peace, like the one I shared with the children. We can read a news article about refugees or a report about human trafficking in our own country. We can support our neighbors as they seek to heal and find homes here and in other communities. We can choose not to look the other way, but to be with others when they are suffering and offer a word of hope, a piece of bread, <coughs> A drink from one community cup. <laughs> World peace begins today in the hearts and lives of each and every one of us as we come to the communion table. In this act, we each preach a wordless sermon about the kind of world that we want to live in. And we begin to create that world one action at a time. Amen.